Hi guys, it's me, Chazzer HD, and welcome to another episode of the podcast reviewing the Mexico City Grand Prix of 2024. And it was way more exciting of a Grand Prix than I expected. I mean, I knew the start of the race we would have, you know, very close racing and that, um, and it would be exciting. But what we got after the start of the race was a real surprise to me. It was um, a pretty good race considering what we usually get at that circuit um, lots of controversy which we will get into don't worry about that um, and plenty of stories really from this particular Grand Prix and plenty of battles through the race as well which was great to see um, even towards the last you know 15 10 laps or so so yeah it was a, a proper good Mexico City Grand Prix uh, let me just quickly go through obviously the top 10 results of this Mexico City Grand Prix. Carlos Sainz taking his second and what might be his final win at Ferrari. A brilliant drive from him. He dominated the race and dominated um, the, the race weekend really from you know once he got pole position he was just absolutely brilliant from then on for the rest of the weekend. Second place, Lando Norris had a very important result for his Drivers' Championship effort. Third place, Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari. Disappointing Ferrari couldn't get a 1-2, but still first and third, a very good result for their Constructors' Championship effort, which of course I'll show how the Championship standings look later on in this podcast coming out of this Grand Prix. Fourth place, Lewis Hamilton. Fifth, George Russell. Pretty good result for Mercedes considering how slow their car was. I think they would be pretty satisfied with that coming out of the Grand Prix. And then Max Verstappen in sixth place. Um, Obviously, again, very controversial race for him, which we will get into. Uh, Kevin Magnussen, seventh. Fantastic drive from him. He was one of the drivers of the day, no doubt about it. Oscar Piastri, 8th. Nico Hulkenberg finished in ninth, And then I believe Pierre Gasly was P10. Also, fantastic weekend from Gasly. Absolutely destroying teammate Ocon, which was really a surprise. Because normally Gasly and Ocon are quite close on performance with each other. But yeah, Gasly was miles ahead this past weekend but yeah that's what happened in Mexico let's get on to the context of those results now if you want to hear my view on the whole Verstappen Norris and all of that stuff the controversy then skip ahead to when I start talking about Red Bull because that's when I'm going to start talking about it because I do want to also get into you know how Ferrari's race went how McLaren's race went before I you know go in you know, to detail about my thoughts on all of that stuff. So again, if you want to hear my thoughts on that, skip ahead to when I start talking about Red Bull, whatever that is, in this podcast. But let's start with the race winners, Ferrari, and congratulations to them, the deserved winners of the Mexico City Grand Prix. They didn't have the best pace for the entire Grand Prix. McLaren with Lando Norris were very quick in those final, say, 30 laps, and... Maybe if Lando was a bit closer to the two Ferraris after Verstappen had got out of his way, maybe he uh, could have made it even more difficult for Sainz than it was in the end. But Ferrari deserved a victory, in my view. They were the quickest team in qualifying. They thoroughly deserved pole position. And in the race, Carlos obviously lost the lead on the first lap. Thankfully kept all you know calm and that. And then... When the race got restarted after the safety car came in, he got after Max Verstappen and pulled off a absolutely brilliant move on Verstappen. I know Verstappen was having issues with the battery down the pit straight. I think with the battery not quite um, working as it should towards the end of that long pit straight. But very aggressive move by Sainz down the inside, got the move done. And then held off Max Verstappen just about after the the couple corners after that. And then once, you know, what happened with Verstappen and Norris happened just behind him right after he overtook. 
he literally sprinted off into the lead and left everyone in the dust, really. Even his teammate, Charles Leclerc, who... You know, Leclerc, still a good result for him, finishing in third. He got the fastest lap, I believe, as well. But I have to say, Leclerc's pace was alarmingly bad in the race. He was miles off the pace of his teammate. Now, there have been race weekends we've seen where Carlos Sainz has been quicker. But for Carlos to be that much quicker than Leclerc, again, a bit of a bit of a an alarm there for Leclerc, I would say, given how good Leclerc has been form-wise in the last few races. So, yeah, a bit concerning, but again, still a good result for Leclerc getting on the podium. But yeah, Carlos Sainz, once he got into the lead and all the trouble happened behind him, he just sprinted off into the distance and he won the race comfortably. For Leclerc, obviously, he did get a bit lucky with the whole Verstappen Norris incident happening the way it did because then he was able to take advantage of that and get up to second relatively easily and then in the second half of the race it wasn't just an issue for Leclerc but I think in general for Ferrari they were just burning their tires out more so than McLaren were and we have seen this in 2024 that as a stint goes on McLaren's tire wear is just better than other teams, especially Ferrari. Even though Ferrari have got good pace, they still are not the absolute best on the grid at looking after their tyres. That award would go to McLaren at the minute, I would say. So that's really why Norris caught and passed Leclerc. Obviously, Leclerc made that mistake, sadly, coming out of the final corner. I think Lando would have passed Leclerc anyway, though even if Leclerc had not made that mistake. So I'm not going to go, you know, I'm not going to criticise Leclerc too much for that error. And also, you know, his form as of late has been really, really good. So it was just, you know, um, a minor mistake in what's been, you know, really top form from Leclerc in these last two or three months. But yeah, I think Leclerc was always going to head for third place because Norris just had too much pace in the McLaren I think for Leclerc to hold him back for those final few laps. At least Leclerc got the fastest lap and got uh, a good amount of points for him. Carlos Sainz again, fantastic win and brilliant amount of points for the Ferrari team. They come away with 41 points, I think it is, from the Mexico City Grand Prix. They go up to second in the Constructors' Championship and are not too far behind McLaren. And with the races coming up between now and the end of the season... There's no reason why Ferrari can't win the championship, the Constructors' Championship, of course. Absolutely no reason why that can't happen. They've got two very high-performing drivers, and looking at the tracks remaining, they should have a race-winning, contending car at probably two of those final four tracks that we're going to, say, Interlagos and Las Vegas. So... I, I can see Ferrari winning the Constructors' Championship. Whether they will or not, at this point, I'd say it's very close between McLaren and Ferrari in, in my head as to who will actually get the job done. But, yeah, Ferrari, no doubt at this point, they have got a very, very good chance of winning the Constructors' Championship, especially with the form they're in, the pace of the car, and the performance level of their two drivers. Congratulations to Carlos Sainz in, again, what could be his final win at Ferrari. And sadly, because he's going to Williams next year, could be his final win for quite a while. Maybe we'll see him win uh, one of these final four races. Would be great to see that again. But yeah, it, it is a shame he's going to Williams because he does deserve to be in a, in a front-running car. But there's just not enough spaces unfortunately. I mean, yeah, if he went to, say, Red Bull to be Max Verstappen's teammate, that would be a massive upgrade on what Red Bull have got, but Red Bull have made it clear that that's not an option for them, So, or wasn't an option for them anyway. So, yeah, that's uh, unfortunately just the way it is. But congratulations, nonetheless, to Ferrari. Let's now go on to McLaren, who, with Lando Norris, we'll start with him, um, I think Lando, despite what happened with Max, 
I think we have to give full praise to Lando for the race he had. I think it was one of the few races he has had in the last three or four months where he performed at his absolute best and delivered the best result he possibly could have. At the start of the race, had a decent start, got right in the slipstream of Verstappen, but he just chose the wrong side to attack. I think he really should have tried to go around the outside, but I mean, it was very tight for space on the outside there, so I don't think you really blame him that much for for that. But, you know, he settled in to, what was it, third place. Then the restart happens. Carlos Sainz gets past Max Verstappen, and then, because Max was put out of shape for um or on the exit of turn three lando then had a good run on max up to turn four went for the move around the outside lando went off the track and then came back on ahead and then max decided to do what he did again i will give my thoughts on that when we get to red bull and then thankfully lando uh, lando sorry kept his head in that uh or in those moments because he could have easily tried to you know, go for a really super aggressive move on Verstappen right after Max did what he did, and you know at that point could have ended up in a, in a race-ending crash. So it's good that Lando, you know, calmed himself down and just settled in behind Max, and then eventually Lando was looking like he was about to pass Max Verstappen. Then Max was brought in and obviously served his twenty-second penalty. And then after that, obviously, Max was no longer a threat to Norris and McLaren. And then their job was to try and put Ferrari under pressure. And again, because McLaren are so good at looking after their tyres, as that final stint to the race wore on, McLaren just got better and better. And that's why they were able to catch and pass, eventually, Charles Leclerc. And... You know, we, we say it all the time, don't we, in Formula 1, if there had only been a few more laps, maybe something else would have happened in terms of who won the race. But if there had been another few laps, maybe Lando Norris could have fought for the race win. But it was a 71-lap race, and, you know, that is, um, you know, th- that is the way it is at the end of the day. But in terms of what Lando did in the race, I can only commend him. I thought he did the absolute best job he possibly could have done in that Grand Prix. You have to remember that after Max had pitted and, and, you know, Lando was then released, Lando was quite far behind the two Ferraris. He was like 13 seconds off the lead and he was like, what was it, six or seven seconds behind Leclerc. So he had a lot of work to do to finish in second and he did it. And given that Ferrari were so quick... And so dominant looking in the first half of the race. It looked nearly impossible that Lando could actually split the two Ferraris at the end. So yeah, fantastic drive from Norris. Takes 10 points out of Max Verstappen's lead. The gap is now down to 47 points. I still don't think Norris is going to win the championship because... I mean, the reason Max finished in sixth place, as we'll get onto in a moment, is really because of the penalties. If it wasn't for the penalties, Max would have finished in fourth place. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that because Mercedes, you know, were so far behind. Even though Mercedes were actually quicker than Max in the second half of the race, Max, you know, before the whole uh, pit stop phase, Max was already quite far ahead of the Mercedes cars. So I think Max would have finished in fourth without those penalties. I think, yeah, you know, obviously Max is not going to have that happen to him for every race between now and the end of the season. So, uh, you know, as as, as has been said, Lando, I think, has to gain like 11 points per race between now and the end of the season to have a chance at winning the championship. That's not going to happen, I think, every Grand Prix weekend remaining, unfortunately, for Lando. He's... uh, Left it too late, I'm afraid, to try and win the championship. Even though we've still got, what, a couple sprint races and four Grand Prix. He's going to need quite a bit of luck, I think, at this stage to win the championship. Uh, Max should still win it. But credit to Lando. You know, if, if you look at the last... 
Oh, I mean, the US Grand Prix, you know, he could have done better there. But I'd say three of the last four races, if you just look at the race day, I think he's done pretty well in, again, three of the last four races. Baku obviously started low down on the grid, came back to finish in fourth place, got a really amazing result considering the circumstances of um, you know, that weekend. Singapore obviously dominated and won. US Grand Prix definitely could have done better, but here in Mexico, again, did the best job he possibly could. So his form in the races, it's improved. It's still not as good as it should be, but it's improving at least. But again, too little too late, I think, in terms of winning the championship. I still think Max Verstappen will get the job done uh, probably in a couple of races time. Uh, for Oscar Piastri, sadly, Oscar just didn't have enough pace to come back through and I think do what McLaren were hoping he could have done and challenged Max Verstappen for sixth place. But I do think Oscar was left out a bit too long for the first stint. Because when he was fighting, if you guys remember, he was fighting Lawson and then the two Mercedes came up and passed him. His tyres were pretty dead. So... I think McLaren could have definitely had pitted him a few laps before and then maybe had a go, um, you know, maybe at Kevin Magnussen. You know, if he had actually not wasted those laps on pretty dead tyres. But, yeah, overall didn't have that great a pace towards the end of the race and ended up finishing where he did, seventh place. Um, in terms of the Constructors' Championship, 24 points is still good for McLaren but obviously with Ferrari scoring as many as they did it's uh you know it's gonna be close let's say the fight for the constructors championship a shame for Piastri by the way that he uh you know had such a poor qualifying because he could have easily I think been on the podium himself uh, especially with the tyre issues that Leclerc was having towards the end of the race so a missed podium opportunity there for Piastri. But um, going forward into this weekend's race, McLaren were pretty quick last year. I remember with Lando Norris, even with last year's car compared to the dominant Red Bull. So we could see McLaren very quick this weekend. I think it's going to be pretty close between McLaren and Ferrari. Probably more so, uh, I think it'll probably be in terms of who's going to be quicker probably leaning in Ferrari's favour just because they've got such a fast car in a straight line which obviously does help at the Interlagos track but it's going to be an interesting fight no doubt about it between Ferrari and McLaren I have no idea what the weather forecast is for for the Sao Paulo Grand Prix this weekend which of course in Brazil always plays a role uh, but yeah McLaren still leading the Constructors Championship still in good shape there but again, drivers championship wise, even though it was a good game for Norris, still, I think, um, too little, too late for him to win it all. Now let's go on to Red Bull Racing. And I'll quickly just start Sergio Perez and his performance because I just want to get that out of the way. Perez was horrendous, absolutely terrible. Um, getting a penalty, of course, at the start for starting out with grid box, which he said he didn't, but it was clear on the TV broadcast. You can see he started ahead of his, uh, you know, wh wh where he should have started in his little grid box. And then um, had a couple incidents with Lawson and Stroll, picked up some damage, and ended up, I think, getting lapped by his teammate, even though Max had 20 seconds worth of penalties. So, yeah, Sergio Perez... He's done, really, isn't he, in Formula 1. The, the the only thing keeping him going is literally Red Bull Racing keeping him in that car. Because I think if they decide to get rid of him, he, I don't think, will be sticking around. I think he'll probably be just riding off into the sunset, which is probably a smart thing to do, given that he's not going to accomplish anything more in his career. But, yeah, just a very sad performance by... Sergio Perez but now let's go on to Max Verstappen who the start of the race made a fantastic start as good of a start as it was last year in Mexico got into the lead fantastic move on the inside 
to get past Sainz. Sainz did go off the track at the start, but from what I remember, I don't think Sainz had his car alongside Max and was always, uh, you know, that gap was always going to close. So I don't think, you know, there, there, there was anything there that should have been penalised. I think it was absolutely fine. Carlos then, uh, thankfully, let Max back through. And then... Carlos Sainz passed Verstappen on the restart. To be honest, even if Sainz, um, or sorry, not even if, uh, not Sainz, even if Max did not have those issues with his battery, Ferrari were going to pass him eventually. They were way quicker than Red Bull in that race. Uh, Max finished, what was it? He finished, um, how far behind? It's like 40 plus seconds behind Sainz, I think it was, or way even further behind than that. Um, and, you know, even if you take the penalties away, Max still would have been comfortably behind in the end. Uh, the Red Bull just had no real pace, especially in the second half of the Grand Prix. But yeah, Science gets past him. Brilliant move by Science. And then, because Carlos had a very dodgy turn two and trying not to violate track limits, Max got held up a bit and then got put kind of out of position on the exit of turn three. Which gave Lando a run on him up to turn four. And then Lando did exactly what he should have done and went for the outside move. Because going around the outside at turn four is a very, you know, doable move. Uh, there's a lot of grip on the outside there. And you can definitely make it work in terms of having then the inside line for the following corner of turn five. That's what Lando was going for. Initially got ahead, Max then did basically what he did in Kota and he braked later. And then at the apex, they were side by side. But then, when Lando got to the edge of the track, there was then contact between Max and Lando. Lando went off, didn't give the position back, and then Max at turn 8, was it? Then decided to dive bomb Lando at a part of the track where overtaking is just not possible and he took himself and Lando off. Now, he got a 10 second penalty for what happened at turn 4 max and then another 10 second penalty for what happened at turn 8, I believe. For what happened at turn 4, I, in my mind, it's debatable as to whether Max Verstappen was, say, in the wrong to the point where he deserved a penalty. Whether you, you know, if you don't like that, fair, you know, if you disagree with me on that, fair enough. But for me, it was debatable that because Lando, even though, yes, he was alongside Max, Lando was not ahead, clearly ahead of Max to the point where Max should have just let Lando go. And I think Max did have the right to defend his position on the inside. But again, if you want to say Max, you know, deliberately pushed Lando off and he was never going to let Lando go through there and deserve the penalty, then, you know, that's your view. But in my view, I I don't think that was a penalty. I, I, I think that should have been left go. And if you look at later on an incident with another Red Bull driver, Sergio Perez and Lance Stroll, I'll try and get a picture of it on screen, but... Perez and Stroll are not exactly alongside each other at the apex, but they are pretty much alongside each other. I wouldn't say anyone is significantly ahead of the other. And Perez pushes Stroll off the track. Now, this did not receive a penalty. The stewards decided no further action for what Sergio Perez did here. So... You know, what is the right, um, you know, what was the right decision when it comes to what happened here at turn four? Because if you're, if you're saying what Sergio Perez did is fine, then what Max Verstappen did, in my view, then is fine. If you want to be consistent, in my view with the Verstappen incident, again, I, I thought it was, you know, it was aggressive what Max did. But, you know, realistically, was Lando actually going to get the overtake done with how Max dived back up the inside? I'm not sure, which is why I say it's debatable as to whether Max deserves a penalty for what happened there. 
at turn four because I'm not sure whether Lando actually was going to make the move and realistically was, you know, going to make it stick given that Max Verstappen breaks even later to get himself alongside at the apex, which is, you know, we've heard all these, you know, rules in the last few days about the whole who's ahead at the apex and all that rubbish in the last few days. Another thing, though, with this incident at turn four that is different, I would say, to what happened at the Circuit of the Americas is that obviously on the exit of turn 12 at the track in Austin, the racing line on the exit of that corner is where Verstappen not uh, exactly put his car, but that's pretty much where the exit of the corner goes. So if you don't have your car ahead at the apex into turn 12, then you're never really going to you know, be able to go off and keep your position. Um, and that's why Lando, you know, we saw him get um, a penalty for overtaking Max off the track. But with turn four in Mexico, the racing line does not see you go all the way out to the edge of the track at turn four. So, again, it's it's debatable for me, whether he deserved a penalty for what happened at turn four. If you guys say, yeah, he deserved a penalty and here's why, I'm not going to argue really against it. Again, it's debatable for me. It's not a clear and obvious slam dunk. What happened at turn eight, though, absolutely was a clear and obvious slam dunk. I am not going to argue that. Max Verstappen 100% deserved a penalty. We all know what happened. Lando, you know, stayed ahead of him. And Max, whose head would have been hotter than the surface of the sun, decided to dive bomb Lando and pretty much do what he did to Lewis Hamilton back in Brazil three years ago. Dive bomb up the inside and take himself off and take Lando off with him. That was a clear penalty. Not even going to debate that. One thing I am mad at, though, is Max getting two 10 second penalties why all of a sudden have they decided that what max did is that bad that now suddenly he needs to get a total of 20 seconds worth of penalties i can tell you why it's because the stewards and the fia are trying to send a message that this type of driving from max verstappen will not be tolerated that's what's happening there, and this is only going to rumble on because we know what Max Verstappen is like. Max Verstappen is very similar to Michael Schumacher. He always is going to push the very edge of the rule book at the very least when it comes to overtaking, defending, all of that. He is he is the closest thing to Michael Schumacher we've ever seen, not just in terms of the way he drives the car, but also the way he uh, races other people. He He really, really is. But why can't the stewards just give the correct penalties rather than let's send a message that this won't be tolerated and just go over the top, really over the top, I would say, with the you know, the amount of penalties in terms of uh, seconds that they ended up giving Max. If I was a steward, I would have given him at least one five-second penalty. If you wanted to give him two five-second penalties for the two separate incidents, fine. But 20 seconds worth, again, way over the top and unnecessary and clearly trying to send a message. When I would rather the stewards just did their job rather than ruin the race, which really they did do. You know, if Max had got, you know, at least 10 seconds less in penalties, he still would have been competitive enough to fight maybe to a degree with other cars that, you know, he obviously, at a part of the field he's fighting at. But it completely took him out of the action and obviously ended up in finishing in sixth place. But, yeah, I, I, I do not agree entirely with what the stewards did. Again, way over the top with the penalties in terms of the amount of penalties... I agree with him getting a penalty for what he did at turn 8. Again, what happened at turn 4, still debatable for me. And again, 
I am confused as to why Perez did not get a penalty for what he did against Lance Stroll, yet Max Verstappen got a 10-second penalty. What is that much more worse about what Max did at Turn 4 to Lando than what Perez did to Stroll? Please let me know in the comments if you do agree with the stewards. But that's my view on the incidents in Mexico. Um, yeah, the stewards, I think, got it mostly wrong in terms of um, the severity of the penalties. And also, in terms of consistency, you know, they, they should have punished Perez as, you know, for what he did against Stroll. Because for you know, looking back at that incident, and there's not that many great angles of the Perestro incident. Unfortunately, there's no. I haven't seen any onboards. Um, unfortunately, so that does hurt our ability to judge the incident. But I don't see what is much worse again about what Max did to Lando that he deserved ten seconds more of penalties than what Perez did. I I just don't. I don't see it. Maybe you guys can educate me in the chat. But Verstappen did go over the top. There is no doubt about it. What he did at turn eight was just absolute lunacy, really. But where do we go forward from this? Well, Max Verstappen, I can tell you now, even if the regulations change, he is not going to change. Max Verstappen is going to do what he is going to do. And everyone will have to act accordingly around that. That's just the way he is. Again, very similar to Michael Schumacher. Back in the day, Michael Schumacher was going to defend his position exactly how he wanted to. And you either could complain about it or somehow find a way to overtake him. That's how it's going to be with Max. Not just for the rest of this season, but for the rest of his career. Either find a way to overtake him or stop complaining because he's not going to change. Even if the regulations change, he is not going to stop doing what he does. This is who he is. He's been racing, you know, in karting and open wheel cars for a long time. He's not just going to suddenly drive completely differently to appease certain fans and certain people in the stewards room. Not going to happen. Not saying that I agree with that, but that is just the way Max Verstappen is. You're not going to change him. It's not going to happen. We've seen this before. You know, I remember, what was it, back in 2018 when he was crashing all, all the time at the start of that season. He defiantly came out at the start of the Canadian Grand Prix weekend and said, I will not change. I will keep doing what I, uh, you know, keep doing what I do. And that's what's made him, so far, a three-time and probably going to make him a four-time Drivers' World Champion. So, that's the way it is. And again, you know, if you go back to the Michael Schumacher era, everyone knew back then watching Formula One that, you know, everyone knew the way Michael was going to defend his position. Even the drivers knew. And they knew that they had to be super aggressive in the way they overtook him. And that there was no point really complaining about Michael's driving because Michael and the FIA were never going to really do anything about it. And the same it, it goes for, for here. So I really just hope the whinging from everyone stops and we can just get on with it. Again, you know, with the regulations changing, I don't see it really making a difference to what Max does on the track. Should the regulations in terms of wheel-to-wheel -wheel, wheel -wheel racing change, that's up for the drivers to decide. But Max is still going to do Max things, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. But let's go on from uh, Red Bull, uh, because you know I've had what I've uh, had to say about all of that, and I don't want this podcast to go on too long. Let's go on to Mercedes-Benz. Um, good little fight Hamilton and Russell had during the race. A couple times where Russell passed Hamilton and then later Hamilton passed Russell. Was aided to a degree by Russell's flappy front wing, which uh, wasn't great. But to be honest, in terms of the battle, even though it was a good battle between Hamilton and Russell, it didn't really matter at all, did it? 
because they were going to finish in fourth and fifth and had no one else really to compete with um, at the end of the day. But as I said at the start of this video, Mercedes, I think, will be satisfied with 22 points being scored from that Grand Prix because they had, without a doubt, the fourth fastest car in Mexico and ended up fourth and fifth, which would be more indicative of, say, having the third fastest car. So you have to say a pretty good result for them because, I mean, there were times, especially in the opening stint of the race, where they were fighting the Haas of Magnussen, who was on their tail for quite a bit. So, yeah, really poor pace, you have to say, for Mercedes. They were um, just absolutely miles behind the top three in the end. Um, but, you know, this weekend in Brazil, I expect they will be not as bad as what we saw in Mexico. In Mexico, they were... Compared to the leaders, they were about half a second per lap off the pace. Which is pretty bad, considering how short of a lap it is in Mexico. In Sao Paulo, the gap should be um, a bit shorter than that. I don't think they'll have the fastest car, but I think they'll definitely be stronger and more competitive in fighting, say, for a podium position. Not saying they're going to get a podium position, but... Yeah, they should be stronger in Brazil and definitely uh, the race after that in Las Vegas. So if you're a Mercedes fan, don't worry. Uh, there will be some further opportunities yet to come before the end of the season. But yeah, this was always going to be a bad race for Mercedes, especially with uh, George Russell having to run an older spec of car uh, compared to his teammate. Because uh, obviously Russell had another big crash in practice too. Um, but yeah, shout out again. Kevin Magnussen, brilliant drive and also fantastic result for Haas. Uh, 12 points, was it, in the end? Was it 12 points they got? No, it wasn't 12 points. It was 8 points they got from the uh, Mexico City Grand Prix. But that puts them on, I think, 46 points. And they are, I think, 40 points behind Aston Martin in the championship. And all I'll say is... I don't think that fight for fifth in the championship between Aston Martin and Haas, I don't think it's necessarily over because Haas are clearly miles quicker than Aston Martin and Haas should be scoring points at every race remaining. And if they can get a couple big points finishes, you know, 10 points plus scored in a couple races before the end of the season, and remember, of course, a couple sprint races, that might help as well. Haas could finish fifth in the championship. They could. Because Aston Martin at the moment, they don't look like they're going to score another point. They have one of the worst cars on the grid. There is no doubt about that, I think, at this point. So, yeah. Brilliant result for Haas. And, yeah, keep an eye out for them. And uh, their, I guess, uh, I guess, fight now to try and catch Aston Martin in the championship. Um, and then, yeah, again, shout out to Pierre Gasly. Brilliant drive from him. Finishing in P10. Gasly, I think he's had a pretty good season, but it's gone under the radar given how bad his car has been. But there, yeah, there you go. That is your Mexico City Grand Prix review. Pretty eventful weekend. And it isn't over yet because, of course, we have yet another Grand Prix this weekend in Brazil. And I can uh, announce to you guys now that I will be doing a qualifying watch-along and race watch-along for this weekend's race in Brazil. On Saturday, I will be going live at 4.30pm UK time for the qualifying watch-along. That'll be about an hour after I think the sprint race finishes in Brazil. And obviously, we'll uh, build up to qualifying and cover that session. And then on Sunday, I will be doing a race watch-along going live two hours before the race. Uh, going live at, I think, 3pm UK time is when I'll be going live to cover the Sao Paulo Grand Prix. And then, as usual, this time next week, there'll be a podcast reviewing the events of the Sao Paulo Grand Prix. So make sure to come along to all of those pieces of content. But cheers, guys, for uh, coming along for the content for this Mexico City Grand Prix. And until this Saturday, live at 4.30pm UK time, 
where I'll cover the events of qualifying in Interlagos, Brazil. It has been me, Chazer HD. Goodbye. <laughs>